So uh, I'm going to take advantage of these few minutes before we start the actual um, presentation to just get to know you a little bit more. Uh, so I'd like to know who of you have already used SS7 network. Wow, okay. I must say something. It's the biggest number I've ever seen for this size of a conference, and uh, I've been making maybe this conference for too many times. Um, whoa, okay. Spock, are you here? Um, everybody hears me well in the back? Yeah, good, perfect. Thanks, Eric. Um, so yeah, actually all of you have been using SS7, uh, but maybe in a very reduced way because when you use this kind of cell phone or maybe a less ancient version of cell phone, uh, you are using SS7. Uh, now, how many of you have been using SS7 through SIP, for example? Very good, okay. So we'll go through the common beliefs of what can be used in order to reach SS7 and how we can attack this and why maybe in the beginning we have SS7. I guess, I guess I'm going to start now. Closer to my mouth. Like this? It's better? Okay. Okay. Maybe? Let's see. Okay. I don't want to, to break Tatiana's equipment, otherwise she's going to kill me. Oh, you want to kill me now? Okay, good. Let's do it in public. <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay, so um, it's quite a rush because what I'm going to do right now is take you into a world where let's imagine we are into the 1990s and you're discovering TCP IP for the first time. Or maybe for, because we have also more ancient people too, so maybe in the 80s. Remember at that time we were in a world where, um, okay, there was no kind of firewall screening you were on the internet, true, you were basically directly connected to the world with public IP address. And nothing like RFC 1918, oh no, it didn't exist, or maybe it exists, but everybody ignored it. Um, we'll see how this state of, the, of affairs of the 1990s or 1980s for TCP IP is exactly the state of SS7 network right now. In the 1990s or 80s, basically what happened is that people considered that a, a LAN, a TCP IP LAN, was something that was connected only to trusted peers. Uh, they were thinking the old novel network kind of paradigm. Where, once again, we're quite in the same set, quite in the same situation, and the worst thing is not the technology. The worst thing is how people think about SS7 networks. They really think it's still a walled garden a closed network where nobody can inject data. And this is wrong. Okay, so this is basically SS7 network. What you can see in there is that what they think about when we talk about security is reliability. And this is not stupid. Actually, from a business perspective, this is the most sensible decision to make, is everything is about reliability. And for these, they didn't hesitate to uh, duplicate anything, duplicate the machines, duplicate the link. So each time we are speaking about one link at the signaling level, we are actually speaking of a set of links direct between the main processor and its backup. There's nothing as a single entity into the SS7 network. And of course, let's say a mated pair would crash at the same time, then you have to have crossover links. So each time one entity, let's say the database of subscriber, connects to another entity, let's say a radio controller, we are talking about actually four systems with four links. So it's a lot of complexity right there. Now, back in the days, the SS7 network was only connected to the roaming partners and only to international well-known points. Um, basic fraud now in SS7 network is about SMS. Sending SMS to a lot of people and making sure they get it so that they can dial premium number and uh, get some money into your account. Um, it deals also with intelligence. Intelligence being able to locate people remotely 
or redirect calls to their home country in order to um, basically uh, continue to listen to conversation, even if the target has moved to another country. And then to real hardcore black ops of intelligence, which deals with taking out a country network, or SS7 network. Wow, this is very contextual. Uh, <laughs> NSA, are you, are you listening? <laughs> so yeah, basically when we deal with, uh, with customers, when we deal with um, telco, telecom company and mobile operators, we deal with people who have mostly the target in mind, the security enemy is mostly in mind, um, fraudsters and people who could affect the availability of the platform. Now, when we talk to governments, they mostly think, especially for small government from uh, countries which are still developing countries, um, they think about how to protect their critical infrastructure from attacks that could take their whole network down. And this is a true set of interests which are not at all converging. Now, here we're not going to talk about all the legacy stuff for a long time, but just a little bit. Why do we have SS7? You know these two guys, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, and one of their first hardware was a blue box. Who used the blue box here? Okay, nice. Who designed an original design or program to make a blue box? Whoa, okay, we are honored, thank you. So thanks to you and thanks to all of you who use Blue Box, we have SS7. Blue Box was just injecting tones into the phone system and saying, hi, I'm not just a regular uh, phone user, I'm a central office switch. And then that would be said by blowing a whistle of 2600 hertz, hence the name of the magazine, into the telephone. And then the remote switch would say, oh, oh, I sorry, I thought you were a regular customer. Now let's send me the tones. The problem with this was signaling was in band, was inside the phone carrying for uh, voice and all the traffic that was going on on the phone network. So uh, it became a big problem, not only because of lost revenue, which was really marginal and not so big, but also because it was untraceable. Um, since you crossed the first point of entrance to the phone network, which was your local central office, then that was where your action were recorded. So you dialed, for example, 1-800 and a phone number, and it's in the first central office that was recorded where you dialed. Now, the fact that you talked to another switch on the network and redirected your call to somewhere else was recorded nowhere. No charge, but no trace. Big problem. So they came up with uh, separating the voice from the signaling. So the basic ar architecture that I showed earlier is actually completely disjoint from the signaling, from the voice lines. So you can have a very hierarchical network at the SS7 net level and a very much meshed network at the voice or what we call trunk layer. So here we have a little bit of infrastructure and very important terms are HLR, uh, basically that's the place where all of your SIM card map to a phone number. And uh, you heard, maybe some of, them, some of you have heard about MC and stuff like that, how many people? Yeah, well, okay. Then basically that's where the mapping happens and then the VLR knows who is where and where to redirect call when you're roaming. AUC is the holy grail of uh, hackerdom, is getting access to the key, key I, which is a real key from, each, from which each of the ciphering of communication is derived. And um, then we have plenty of stuff. Two interesting stuff are STP. Let's see that as if SS7 network had one central router, or maybe let's say four, as we've seen earlier. And when you talk to STP, this central router, you can do many things. And then funny stuff, like legal interception gateway. Right now, there's a talk on another room which talk about ETSI specification and LIG, legal interception gateway. In each mobile operator, what you have is this legal interception gateway that enable a cop to call a number, enter a pin code, and then 